This is Dr. John Aleftariatis from the Aortic Institute at Yale University School of Medicine, and I would like to provide a common sense overview of the genetics and genomics of thoracic aortic disease. I would like to start by taking a look at the history of the genetics of thoracic aortic aneurysm. I would like to move on to elucidating the discovery of familial patterns of thoracic aortic aneurysm. Then I would like to cover the Mendelian genetics of transmission, and then the molecular genetics at the DNA level. And I would like to finish up with a discussion of the molecular genetics at the RNA level, including a promising investigational RNA signature test that we have been developing at Yale University. There is a history behind the recognition of the genetics aspects of thoracic aortic aneurysm. As far back as 400 BC, Hippocrates, in his well-known manuscript on airs, waters, and places, noted that the nomads and Scythians had lax joints and easy bruising. We see here a painting depicting those warriors in battle. It appears that Hippocrates was describing Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. As we are aware, Antoine Marfan in 1896 in France recognized the disorder that came to bear his name. In the early 1900s, Edvard Ehlers in Denmark and Henri Alexandre Danlos in France recognized and reported what came to be known as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. I would like to recognize the groundbreaking work done in the recognition of the genetic patterns of transmission of aneurysm disease by my mentor, Dr. M. David Tilson at Yale University. I remember the excitement in the audience in the amphitheater at Yale when at Grand Rounds, Dr. Chow Dang and Dr. David Tilson presented their findings. First of all, they recognized in a unique observation that aneurysm disease of the abdominal aorta and occlusive disease of the iliofemoral system were two different diseases. Furthermore, they discovered that abdominal aortic aneurysm ran in families and often had a dominant pattern of transmission. These were unique and seminal observations. In the present era, we need to recognize the very important work done by Bart Lowys, now in Belgium, and by Hal Dietz at Johns Hopkins. As well, extraordinary work has been done by Diana Milowitz in recognizing and pinpointing the precise mutations that underlie thoracic aortic aneurysm in many patients. It is speculated that the great American president, Abraham Lincoln, may have had Marfan disease. This is considered because of his lanky build and his great height. Historians have become very interested in this possibility. In fact, historians have learned about Marfan disease and the fact that it may cause aortic insufficiency. Furthermore, they have learned that aortic insufficiency may cause a widened pulse pressure and that that pulse pressure may result in what we know as a quinky's pulse, that is, an exaggerated pulsatility in the extremities. In extremely severe cases, this may result in bobbing of the fingers or toes. In the original of this photograph, the toe of the left foot of Lincoln is out of focus. Historians conclude that because the foot is out of focus, Lincoln had Quinky's pulse, so he had aortic insufficiency, so that he must have had Marfan syndrome. Now, why do historians care about this? Well, we know that, absent surgical therapy, patients with Marfan disease do not live beyond their mid-40s. And, of course, Lincoln could not have had a surgical treatment of his aorta in the 1860s. So historians have concluded that he would have died anyway, even had he not been shot on that fateful day in the Ford Theater. Now, the genetics of Marfan syndrome have been thoroughly elucidated, and several hundred specific mutations on the fibrillin 1 gene have been identified that produce the Marfan phenotype. In the next few minutes, I hope to convince you that Marfan's is just the tip of the genetic iceberg in thoracic aortic aneurysm. 
Let's consider now how the family patterns of thoracic aortic aneurysm were discovered. As seen in this pedigree, the father passed on the diathesis towards aortic dissection to each and every one of his natural offspring. It is very often true in medicine that our patients teach us what we need to know. In this example, I was making rounds on a 59-year-old woman. Three days earlier, we had operated on her for type A aortic dissection. At this point, she was well enough to carry on a conversation, and I asked her if anyone in her family had had a similar problem. She said, Doctor, don't you remember? You operated on my mother three years ago. Of course, I had no recollection. Then I asked her again, I said, anybody else in your family who's been affected by aortic dissection? And that's when she started to cry. She was inconsolable. The tears simply would not stop flowing. I could not console her. My team couldn't, our nurse couldn't. Finally, she was able to regain her composure, and I said, what is it, ma'am? What do you want to tell us? And she said, Doctor, I don't know. My little girl, they said it was her heart. We investigated and we found that her 12-year-old daughter was the youngest individual ever to die of type A aortic dissection at Yale University. Here, with this example, we had three generations affected in one family. This was like a hit on the head telling us that we were dealing with a genetic disease. Our team went to work constructing family trees, and I'll speak to you in a moment about the results that we found. I will digress briefly to show you one of my favorite tests for aneurysm disease. This test does not require approval by any healthcare agency. It doesn't cost any money. I call it the thumb palm test. If an individual can cross his thumb over beyond the edge of the flat palm, that indicates a high likelihood of connective tissue disease. It means that the long bones are excessive and the joints are lax. Let's move on now to see what has been uncovered about the Mendelian genetics in thoracic aortic aneurysm. After learning of that family with three generations affected, we put our team to work on compiling pedigrees of large numbers of families. We compiled 100 pedigrees for our patients with thoracic aneurysm or dissection in our initial investigation. Among those 100 families, we found that in 21%, that is 21 families as depicted here, there was a known aneurysm in a family member. Our findings indicated that the predominant pattern of inheritance was autosomal dominant, but these other patterns indicated also obtained. We continued on constructing pedigrees, and we were able to put together hundreds and hundreds of family trees. We found that this 21% likelihood of having a family member affected was sustained no matter how many families we studied. We were able in 1999 to produce this clinical report about these findings. Dr. Diana Milowitz, we came to find out, had very recently published data that was absolutely identical to ours, finding a very, very similar likelihood of a family pattern and very similar Mendelian methods of transmission. In this slide, I would like to show you an important pattern that we discovered. I show you the proband sites of aneurysm and where the aneurysms are located in the kindred. In the front column, I am showing you descending aneurysm patients. And please note that their kindred more commonly had abdominal aortic aneurysms. In the back row, I am showing you our ascending patients. And please note that their family members most commonly, overwhelmingly, also had ascending aneurysms. This is all consistent with ascending and descending thoracic aortic aneurysms being two diseases divided at the ligamentum arteriosum. And please give this some thought. Ascending aneurysms are very highly familial. The aorta is very rarely calcified. The aorta essentially never has thrombus within it. 
and these aneurysms are not really correlated with traditional risk factors for arteriosclerosis. On the other hand, in the descending or abdominal aorta, the wall is almost invariably calcified when there is an aneurysm, and the aneurysm very frequently contains thrombus. Furthermore, the descending thoracic and abdominal aneurysms are highly correlated with general risk factors for arteriosclerotic disease. These really are two different diseases, and now we're recognizing that this is correlated also with the cell lineage of origin in these different portions of the aorta. Of course, any discussion of the genetics of thoracic aortic aneurysm would be incomplete without talking about the bicuspid aortic valve and its related aortic aneurysm. Here we see an attractive picture of a bicuspid aortic valve, which is heavily calcified and stenotic. This is the ascending aneurysm that goes along with that highly calcified bicuspid valve. Despite the very high prevalence of bicuspid valve disease, its Mendelian and molecular genetics are still incompletely understood. Let's take a moment now to look at the relative impact of Marfan syndrome and bicuspid aortic valve disease on the occurrence of aortic dissection. If you have Marfan syndrome, you have a 40% likelihood of dissecting your aorta during your lifetime. However, Marfan disease occurs in only 0.01% of the general population, or 1 in 10,000 human beings. Now let's think about bicuspid aortic valve. Although the likelihood of aortic dissection during your lifetime is only 5%, bicuspid aortic valve is extraordinarily common being seen in 1 to 2 percent of the general population. If one does the mathematics, bicuspid aortic valve causes many more cases of aortic dissection than the better appreciated Marfan disease. It is important to note as well that in bicuspid patients, dissection usually occurs long before the onset of significant aortic stenosis or insufficiency. Studies by our team have shown that the aorta in patients with bicuspid aneurysm grows more rapidly than in patients with tri-leaflet aortic valves. Let's go on now to discuss the molecular genetics at the DNA level for thoracic aortic aneurysm. In this slide, I have summarized for you the current state of knowledge on DNA mutations in patients with thoracic aortic aneurysm. In the first column, I indicate the name of the syndrome. In the next column, the chromosome that is involved. In the next column, the gene that's affected. In the next column, the protein that is disturbed by the corresponding mutation. In the next column, the location of that protein. In the next column, the frequency of the mutation. And in the final column, it's predominant mechanism of inheritance. This is a busy slide. I've tried to keep it as simple as possible, yet have it be a reference for you in your reading and also in your clinical care. This table is found in the article that accompanies this keynote lecture. Please note that all of these syndromes are transmitted in an autosomal dominant pattern, except for ATS, the arterial tortuosity syndrome, which is transmitted in a recessive pattern. Please note also that I find it easier to refer to these syndromes by the genes which are affected, as I've indicated with red circles. I would like to point out a few characteristics about some of these syndromes. Please note that the ACTA2 syndrome, identified by Dr. Milowitz, is the most common of the familial etiologies of thoracic aortic aneurysm accounting for perhaps 10 to 15 percent of our familial non-syndromic patients. In particular, individuals affected by the ACTA2 mutation can present with dissection at a diameter smaller than the usual criteria for intervention. These patients also have a risk for stroke or myocardial infarction. Next, the MHY11 mutation affects 2 percent of our families with non-syndromic transmitted aneurysm disease. Regarding MHY11, 
it is important to bear in mind that the affected proteins are involved in smooth muscle cell contraction. Moving on now, the MYLK mutation affects 1% of our families. The mutation here is also involved in smooth muscle cell contraction, but what distinguishes patients with this mutation is that it is exclusively involved with dissections and not aneurysms. So it is very difficult to counsel the patients regarding the best time for surgical intervention. It is beyond the scope of the present lecture, but I strongly recommend the paper indicated here by El Hamamsi and Yacoub on the cellular and molecular mechanisms of thoracic aortic aneurysms in Nature Review's cardiology. This really is a must read for anyone interested in aortic diseases. And as you can see from this one diagram that I've selected for you, it shows us where these different mutations affect the cellular mechanisms within the aortic wall. This is a very important article and a must read. Let's move on now to finish up with some findings regarding RNA alterations in the molecular genetics of thoracic aortic aneurysm. I will be speaking to you about some investigations being done at Yale University in conjunction with Celera Genomics and Applied Biosystems. I am pleased to report at the present time that the study I'll show you here has recently been replicated at Yale in a different group of patients. So we have more confidence than we did after only one single study had been performed. In simple terms, the DNA represents the blueprint for how our bodies will be built, like the blueprint of the house that I've shown you here. The RNA tells us what rooms, or by analogy, what systems in the body are actively undergoing work, whether it's your dining room or your garage or some other room in your house, or that is, some other system in your body. There is no commercial version of the test that I am describing to you now. This is purely a laboratory investigation at the present time. However, this type of test is reducible to a handheld diagnostic device that can be used at the patient's bedside. What we did was to look at 33,000 RNAs. We looked at these in our aneurysm patients and contrasted our findings with those in normal control patients. In particular, we used the spouses of our aneurysm patients because spouses often have a similar age and share a similar ethnic background in many cases. They also have a similar diet and environment. We looked at these 33,000 RNAs, and from among them we selected 41 that were the most upregulated or were the most downregulated, representing different metabolic pathways within the body. These tests were all done on the RNA extracted from circulating white blood cells. As you can see here, our test has an overall accuracy of about 80%. If all the red dots were in the three-dimensional oval depicted in panel B, the test would have been 100% accurate. Also, that would have placed all of the blue circles within the blue three-dimensional oval. Our test was about 80% accurate in determining from the blood alone whether the patient harbored a thoracic aortic aneurysm or not. We are excited because an 80% diagnostic accuracy is very, very good in clinical medicine. The PSA test, which has recently come under some attack but was used for decades, had an overall accuracy in the 20 to 30% range as you see here. I'll spend a moment explaining these hierarchical clustering diagrams because they are appearing very frequently in our literature. Each vertical line represents a patient. Each horizontal line represents an RNA, one of the 33,000 tested. Green means underexpressed and red means overexpressed. Here in this cluster diagram that I am showing you, if all of the reds were together, representing the aneurysms, and all of the blues were together, representing the controls, our test would have been 100% accurate. You can see that it was pretty darn good. In fact, it was 100% accurate 
in distinguishing ascending from descending thoracic aortic aneurysm patients, and 100% accurate at distinguishing familial from non-familial thoracic aortic aneurysm patients. We are very excited about this test as a potential screening mechanism for the silent killer of thoracic aortic aneurysm disease. If we can identify these patients, either in high-risk groups or in the general population, that would be a key advance towards eliminating death from this disease. We are quite excited that our replication test was also affirmative, but we are not yet ready for a stage of clinical application. It is important to point out that our investigations at Yale have shown that if a patient has a thoracic aortic aneurysm, there is a 10% likelihood that, based on his genetics, he also harbors an intracranial aneurysm. So we investigate all our patients for intracranial aneurysms before taking them to the operating room, all of our elective patients, that is. Although we're focused on the thoracic aorta, we need to keep in mind that an intracranial aneurysm may be just as important for the patient's livelihood, and especially for his quality of life, as the thoracic aneurysm on which we are focused. So far, everything we have discussed about thoracic aortic aneurysm has a negative impact for the patient. Is there anything positive conferred by the mutation that causes the thoracic aortic aneurysm? Well, we feel that we have stumbled on something positive, that we have found a silver lining in the cloud of thoracic aortic aneurysm disease. We noted in operating on many, many patients with a root aneurysm or an ascending dissection that their femoral arteries tended to be spared from arteriosclerosis. We know from the tragic losses in Korea and Vietnam that many young Americans, even in the 18 to 21 year age range, often harbored fatty streaks or atheromas in their arteries, even at this early stage of their lives. The patients that we operate on are usually at a much more advanced age, yet we found essentially no arteriosclerosis, no atheromas, no fatty streaks in their femoral arteries, and using those arteries for cannulation in thousands of patients. This sent us on to an investigative process. In particular, we measured the degree of arteriosclerosis in our aortic root or ascending dissection patients and compared these measures of arteriosclerosis to a normal population, again represented by the patient's spouses. In the graph on the left, you can see that we measured the carotid IMT, or intimal medial thickness. This is a well-known marker of arteriosclerosis and a pretty early marker. Please note that our aortic root and ascending dissection patients had a much lower carotid intimal medial thickness, that is a much lower degree of arteriosclerosis than even normal individuals. And it does appear that we are measuring something real because patients with dyslipidemia, diabetes, a family history of arteriosclerosis, hypertension, male gender, or advanced age had a higher carotid IMT. We also looked at a later indicator of arteriosclerosis, namely the total body arterial calcium score. Please note again that our patients with ascending dissection or annuloaortic ectasia or root aneurysm had a significantly lower total body calcium score than normal patients. And again, it appeared that we were measuring something real because the standard risk factors of gender, hypertension, smoking, dyslipidemia, diabetes, and age all produced a higher total body calcium score. So, we feel that the patients with root disease are protected by the silver lining against systemic arteriosclerosis. This is a significant positive for these patients. We have looked into molecular data regarding the impact on molecular mechanisms of the mutations that cause thoracic aortic aneurysm. We find evidence from molecular studies that is consistent with these clinical observations on the protective effects of such mutations against arteriosclerosis. Specifically, the matrix metalloproteinases, or MMPs, that are involved in the pathogenesis of aneurysms are pro-aneurysmal, but 
the molecular studies indicate, these MMPs are anti-atherogenic. In simplistic terms, the MMPs that break down the aortic wall are atheroma before it has a chance to progress or advance. I would like to conclude this basic lecture regarding the fundamental genetics of thoracic aortic aneurysm with two observations. It appears clear that we are headed toward a brave new era in thoracic aortic aneurysm. Firstly, we are coming very close to molecular identification of individuals at risk for thoracic aortic aneurysm. That is just what one needs for a silent killer disease. Secondly, as we learn more about the particular clinical characteristics of patients affected by specific mutations, that is largely through the work of Dr. Diana Milowitz, we are coming closer and closer to a personalized strategic management of those individuals based on the particular operating characteristics of that disease. In other words, we're headed towards a higher level of treatment of this disease. We surgeons, we love what we do. We love to cut out the aorta and put in a new aorta. It's intensely challenging, it's risky. It gives us a great deal of satisfaction. But it is incumbent on individuals with an interest in aortic diseases to try to lift the treatment of these diseases to a higher level. And that level is clearly a genetic one, especially at the molecular genetic level. I thank you for your attention.